Welcome. So uh, for the live stream, I just need to be near the mic here. So that's a shame, but uh, let's start moving around. Hopefully you don't mind. So yeah, I don't like this formal infrastructure, but it's all great. So um, today is a very unique day. It's a very unique day because we are all here. Two, two, two things actually very unique today is that we have the younger generation here today looking for solutions to solve the plastic crisis. Seb, who is 14, is here. Ellie, Phoebe, you know, Jasmine. And there are two more actually coming in from Jersey, and the flight got delayed, but they'll be here. <laughs> they're all here looking for something. And we need to find out what they're looking for. And the second unique thing here is that today, I'm incredibly proud, and thanks to you, that we have people from the entire value chain, from the plastic manufacturers all the way to waste management. Violia is here. Tom Rye is here. Marks and Spencers, Just Eat, everyone is here. We can really make a change. And in the evening, we'll have much more, more interesting people here in the evening. We have got VCs here. We have got uh, impact investment funds here. We have got everyone here to really make a change. Very unique day today, and thank you. Please give a huge round of applause for ourselves that we are all here today. Thank you so much. This is so unique here that we have DEFRA sending out a statement at half past nine in the morning. And this is in the highest levels of the government looking at us today here, what are, are we gonna achieve here? And you're here on a Saturday. It's very exciting for DEFRA, for number 10, for Michael Gove, our environment secretary himself. And there would be obviously a lot of follow-ons going on from here as well. So we have managed to mobilize everyone and even the departments here to really solve this plastic crisis that you're gonna solve today. But before all that, how, how, how are we here? It's all about the inc incredible task that the whole team has put together here. That's gonna be Leila and Chris, who's gonna run the whole day today. They put a lot of hard work in curating the right teams and gonna be curating uh, the different challenges and making sure that we are on track to solve the problem. And Leila has been so grateful in giving us this venue and Chris as well in, in helping me learn a lot of stuff during this whole process because otherwise I would have run this event in December and we would not be able to pull off this kind of event, definitely. And also, I have incredible help from everyone else. You know, from 1080p Media, Cliff, who's actually helping us out with the video production today. It's incredible. I've got help from, Blue, um, from Jonathan from Blue Aurora Media, who's helping us with the PR and things like that. It's really, really incredible. And I have got Sustainable Ventures, Chris, who's coming in. We got an awards for that. We also got Crowdcube offering us some award in the, in the, in the, in the evening, which I'll get to later in, as, as, as the time progresses in the whole day. And obviously, the whole team. Uh, consisting of, you know, uh, Keith, who's unable to make it today. Then we have got Erica, we've got Gemma, we've got uh, Mel, um, or we have got uh, Dora, we have got Jake as well. So I've got everyone here. Uh, because of the hard work they put in, this event is possible today. Uh, these are the tags here today as well. Uh, the tag is, uh, the, the, the handle are uh, Plastic Hack in Twitter and Plastic Hackathon on Instagram. Please tweet, retweet. The more we share, the more people will know about this revolution we're creating here to solve the plastic crisis. And the, and the hashtag is Plastic Hackathon. And it would, never, it would never be possible without the real help that actually Sally believed in me, uh, Innovate UK and, and, and uh, UK Circle Plastics Network. Without their help, it would not be possible. And definitely Robin, who is here as well, and just one phone call, Robin, Robin made sure that everything happens. It's incredible to have Robin, thank you. And just it. It's not because they're partners, because we share the same message about solving, and they're here to find solutions to scale using their whole network of restaurants around the world. And Marks and Spencers, Kevin Weiss is unable to be here today, but he's been so grateful. But we have Roger here, who's gonna really help us out, take these ideas to market if possible. The thing is, everyone is here to really make things happen, and we can do it. Right, so who am I? I'm Dhruv Borua, I have my own foundation, but then that's not important. The question is, why am I here today? Everything started with this clip.
hard one. You might need to cut some of those. Yeah, cut them. Yeah, cut them. Oh. Nice job, it's not extremely tight actually. Beautiful. Oh, so close. Yeah. Yeah. So this was when uh, I was sailing from London to Brazil, but this is a different team when they're sailing in the Clipper Around the World race. This is near Panama. And they had to stop racing to rescue these turtles, stuck with fishing nets and bottles. And, uh, and I knew I had to do something about it. Came back to London, got my bike together, and then I, and I cycled the whole length of the River Thames and then in New York in the Hudson River, and then in the Netherlands and everywhere. But the question is, so what? I have reached around 300 me million people worldwide on all the biggest media channels, CNN, BBC, you tell they're all there. But the question I ask myself, so what? It's absolutely useless unless we can solve this crisis. And I'm here looking for solutions. And that is why I think we can do it. Everyone is here to make it happen. I think we'll be able to solve the crisis for sure, Some, something for sure. But let's find out. Why are you here today, right? So to do that, uh, I request you to all stand up and find someone near you that you have not spoken, spoken to before and ask them, why are you here today? For 30 seconds, yeah. Can we now all sit down, please? Thank you. So I think now we know why is everyone else here as well. And now you know why everyone else is here. I hope so, that you know. <laughs> and I hope you're going to tell me the answer I'm expecting. <laughs> so yeah, so why are you here today? Solutions. Solutions, yeah. I think it's solutions. Is it solutions, guys? Yeah. Great. Give me a loud. If it's solutions, say yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Solutions. 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 Now getting back to my, you know, like sailing spirit. <laughs> but great. But now we know why I am here, why you are here, why your neighbors are here, right? Let's now find out why else is this young people here as well. Let me welcome Ellie, who is here, to talk about why is she here. I'm 17 years old, and I'm here because it's time for the world to change. I want to be part of the solution, and I want to act now before it's too late. I recently realized that in my morning routine, it was already full of single-use plastic. I would wake up, and I'd brush my teeth with a plastic toothbrush. I'd walk into the shower with my shower wash in hand, plastic bottle. After I shower, I moisturize with lotion from a plastic tube. I even put deodorant on from a roll-on plastic. Before I'd even gotten dressed, I'd already contributed to the single-use plastic problem, and that's not okay. Humans have already produced 8.4 billion metric tons of plastic to this day. That's the same weight as one billion elephants. We cannot continue like this. We're all here because we've accepted this problem. We're here because we want to find the solutions to this problem. And I'm so grateful for that. Because we're helping my generation and many more to come to find the solution to this problem. And we have to act now, we have to come together. And I know that there are people here today that can help me find solutions to my plastic morning fill routine. My personal care routine that's full of the single use plastic items. And I'm so grateful that we can all work here today. And I'll pass on to Phoebe, who is equally passionate about finding the solutions to this plastic problem. Hi, I'm Phoebe, and I'm 16, and I also go to Wickham Abbey School. I'm an addict. I live in a consumer society, and I am responsible. I, 
even just a few years ago, I wouldn't even thought twice about grabbing these items. I wouldn't even have thought twice about grabbing these items off the shelves. And I'm sure that you are all the same, and I'm here to make a change. And I know there's people like MS today that are here to be part of this change. But then I began to run. I began to run miles through country hills and London streets, picking up each individual piece of litter as I went along. This made me think about who drops this litter, where does it come from, and why is it so difficult to dispose of? And then I thought about the big picture, our consumer society that is grabbing at convenience and getting through single-use plastics by the seconds. And I decided to turn this anger and look for solutions, and not just change minds, with my, and my, my generation is here to not just change minds, but to change business strategy and business techniques in order to work towards a more affordable, convenient and sustainable way to package our groceries. And now I'm going to hand over to my friend Jasmine, who's going to re-emphasize the urgency of these solutions. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine and I'm 17, and I also go to Wickham Abbey School. Um, I'm here today because I'm fed up with the inexcusable amount of one-use plastic that we have in our society today. I'm here because I'm fed up with feeling hopeless of not being able to do anything to help this issue. But most of all, I'm here because I'm fed up of waiting for someone else to create the solution. I'm here because I want to be part of creating this solution, and I think it's time that we had a solution that we can implement to change our plastic behaviours. When I was little, I was shown this mockumentary about a plastic bag. It followed the journey of the plastic bag to its homeland, the sea. Um, I found it very amusing, and throughout the video, it had a sarcastic tone until the end, where it had a much more serious message. It talked about how we unsustainably use plastic bags and how this problem is getting out of control. This really struck a chord with me. And it made me go into research and look into the consumerist plastic society that we live in today. I started to learn a lot more, and I learned about how there's so much advocation within our society today to take action against this plastic problem. However, I also believe that when I was looking into it, there wasn't actually that much change happening within the products. I couldn't see that much. And I thought that this was a massive issue. And I thought that we are really just um, scraping on the, our capabilities and the changes that we can make. There's so much that we can do. And I really believe that we should push this forwards and actually make that change. By being here today, we are all able to be part of that solution. We're all able to make that change today, being here at the Plastic Hackathon. Since the start of the 21st century, um, takeaway delivery services have skyrocketed. It's really been a massive growth in that sector. And this has caused takeaway sales to also massively increase. But that has also meant that those plastic takeaway boxes that we use have grown massively in usage. And there has been an increase, and now we're going to have stacks of them in our homes not being used or just thrown away. This is very, very bad. However, we must look at it positively. We must use this as inspiration. All those companies that have grown massively within a decade or so mean that if we come up with the right solution, if we implement it correctly, then we can make a change and we can make it in a short amount of time. We can create a solution, a successful solution, a money-making business, and we can make solutions which will change our planet today. It's so inspiring to have companies here, such as Just Eat, who will drive this change in the takeaway sector. <coughs> and I'm so grateful to everyone here who is willing to make that change. I hope that today we can find solutions to this issue and solve it once and for all. Now I will hand over to Seb, who will talk more about the takeaway industry. Uh, good morning. My name's Seb. Uh, I'm 14 years old. And um, uh, sorry. <laughs> at, this, at this point in time, we've hit, we've had the largest technological advance that we've ever had before. We have the ability to 3D print organs, yet we still can't solve the plastic, the plastic problem. We, ha uh, we had two, two doctors last year who actually cured blindness, yet we still can't cure the plastic problem. We even had NASA send a probe to the sun, yet we still can't even cure the plastic problem. And this, 
the plastic problem. We've had nukes and we've had various different things which have got us very close to ending the world. Yeah, the silent killer, the pl plastics, have come up. And on the takeaway side of it, things like plastic boxes are used every single, every single time you get an order. Fair enough. Not everyone's that bothered to cook for themselves every night. Fair enough that we all need a takeaway sometimes. But what is the reason for us having these plastic boxes that all we're going to do is throw away? Why do we need something that we're going to throw away? Why do we even need the box in the first place? Why are the companies unable to just bring us maybe a plate that they reuse, a little box that they reuse, and they put it on your plate and they leave? That's all we need. All we want is the food. We don't want the boxes. We don't want all the pollution. All we're doing is contributing to the 5.35 trillion pieces of plastic debris in our oceans, which are killing fish and various different, various different living things. And um, honestly, I, it's, this has got to change. And I know there are people in this room who have the ability to change this. So uh, I, I'd like to hand back over to Strav. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sam. So what are you guys looking for? Solutions? Solutions. 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 Great. It's, it's very inspiring. And it's, it's such an incredible opportunity, again, for the retailers and for the other brands in the room, because you have your future consumers. And if they're not going to buy your products, then you're going to be out of business. So you might as well learn from them. They're here to help you make sure that you continue to do business with them in the future. Such a unique opportunity. And they are going to take this message back to their generation. It's not just today here. It's not going back to the younger, younger generation. And it's very important. And DEFRA is following this because there are other follow-on stuff that are going to happen as a part of the strategy going forward. But we all need to really mobilize the young people, get them involved, and crack on with it. Again, let, let, let me reiterate the fact that I love plastic. I've been so plastic right now. Plastic is a fantastic material. I mean, it has changed lives, and we all know that. Let's stop demonizing plastic. It's all about the single-use plastic that, that we have a problem with, the plastic that you use for 20 seconds, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and stays there for 700 years. This is insane. So that's, that's what I don't like. Uh, I'm not comfortable with. The focus today is reuse and refill. It's very important to have the right focus so you don't get carried away. And, 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 and you know, start focusing on other stuff. So reuse and refill is the focus today. And one more thing I'd like to highlight here is that today is not a day of complaining. Why do I have uh, three layers of packaging? Why is my packaging in plastic? We all know this stuff. Everyone knows this stuff. That's why you're here. Today is about going forward, looking forward. How can we solve all the challenges we have today? Let's stop asking people, why is my uh, cucumber wrapped in a plastic uh, bag? Because Lots of forums for that. But today is about how can we solve this stuff? And, and Leila and Chris has curated a very nice way of identifying where you can in, uh, interject and make changes. Definitely, I, I will hand it over to them, and they will take you through the whole journey. Today here is about going bold. Be bold. You know, think about why things can't, can't be done. Go bonkers. I never expected DEFRA to send this tweet out this morning. But I always try to do this big stuff. Because something always happens. I've even sent a letter to Sir David Attenborough, and he's hand wrote a letter back to me that he can't make it. It's a real uh, shame. But now they all know about this stuff. Uh, 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 His Royal Highness Prince Charles knows about this stuff. Everyone knows about today. That's important. I never believed that I would be here today if I was speaking to you three years before, to be really honest. I spent two years now doing it because I'm so into this now that I really want to solve the problem. And my personal goal is to inspire the whole country from mourning about plastic, from awareness to solutions. Let's solve the crisis and, and make money by doing that. Because only then it will scale. So challenge everything you have, which I think the young people will challenge, uh, all the industry leaders. And the industry leaders, please challenge them too. Then we, let's go for the impossible things today. The things can't be done because you know what? We can make everything possible, for sure. And everyone is here today to really make the decision as well. The goal is to come up with business models that can encourage human behavior change without compromising on convenience and profit. So it's so important. As I told you before, we have people with the money from classic investors to VCs uh, to uh, private equity firms and also to impact investment funds and also crowdfunding. So there is no excuse. We have the customer. 
Justit and MNS right here and more. I mean, I'm not telling all the brands here, but they're all brands I know. I'm not gonna tell you, you'll know them already. Uh, so you have the funds, you have the customer. I want you to quit your jobs by the end of today because it's all happening. And that's my KPI. How many of, of you would actually quit your job? And if you can make it happen, it's incredible. Right, so guys, let's make it happen. I'm now gonna hand it over to Sally briefly to talk about Innovate UK and the UK Circular uh, Plastics Network and how, and the incredible things that they're doing to really uh, uh, catalyze the circular economy around plastics uh, in the country. Over to Sally. Thanks, Julie. No worries, yeah. Uh, are you good with a laptop? How can I follow these fantastic speakers, particularly the young people there? At your age, there's no way I would have stood up in front of this many people, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the geeky scientist in the room. My name's Sally, Sally Beckon, and um, I'm heading up the UK Circular Plastics Network. <laughs> About a year ago, my mum said to me, plastics are bad, aren't they? And I was like, oh my God, no. Do I put this around my neck? <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're not bad. Drew's pointed that out. They're, they're enablers. They're really important to our society. They help us live healthier, safer, more enjoyable lives. Um, so the thing is that we should really value them. Um, I, have, uh, I wrote an article, a blog, about uh, after my mum spoke to me called Plastophobia. Uh, you can take a look at it. I'll, I'll you know, send you the link if you're interested. But I don't believe we should be phobic about plastic. I think we should realise its value. I've got two pieces of plastic here that weigh just under 10 grams each, right? And if I drop these on the floor, most people would walk past the carrier bag, but there's no way anyone would walk past that 10 pound note. They are both polymers. They are both the same matter. Oh, nice one. Well, interestingly enough, if I collected 100 of these carrier bags together, turned them back into oils and waxes or for fuel, I could power my car for a kilometer. I think we should value plastic. We would never have let it in our environment. It would never have got into the sea. And I wouldn't be standing here now. We wouldn't be needing to do what we need to do. So for me, it's about valuing what this material is and making the best of it. So you have me today on my weekend. So you have me as a person. So I want to tell you a little bit about me so you kind of see what I get up to. Um, I'm into beach cleans. I'm a bit sad. You know, you find massive big car tires. I live on the south coast, so it's not very, um, there aren't many waves. It's quite you know, nice and um, calm when the waves come in. So I often go to the tide line. That's me there picking through where the seaweed is. And hidden under the seaweed is this stuff. It's horrific. I've spent my life in the polymer industry. I had a degree in chemistry, a PhD in polymer science. I've developed pom polymers. I've polymerize them, I've depolymerized them, so I know them intimately. I think they're amazing materials, but that is absolutely horrific. Um, I analyze it, I'm a bit sad, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. So, I work, in my work life, I work for uh, Innovate UK's Knowledge Transfer Network, and I'm heading up the UK Circular Plastics Network, and just, you know, the money comes from government, so it's from the business arm of the government. This is where all the money has gone in the last three years. 140 million pounds has been spent on research, and I know quite a few of the projects there, and there are people in this room who have had funding from that. But if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, you'll see that not much money went into human behavior and human effects. So I think that's gonna be a real push, government-wise, going forward. This encompasses what Innovate UK and UKRI see, uh, the plastic space, I can show you this later, it's not important, you all know about it and the things that are possible, but I'm intimately aware of all the actions and things that are going on in this space. If you look at this report, Resource in the Future, I think it's absolutely fantastic, take a read of it, it can, shows you how much waste plastic material we have in the UK, 3.7 million tonnes, 2.2 million tonnes of that is from packaging, and the rest is from non-packaging, and the white box there is what we're, is a missed opportunity, there's so much material out there that we're wasting that we could be taking back and using. Uh, and I've got a little, we might refer to this later in the day in terms of where we might go for first, HDPE is our largest volume material followed as you see in the chart with various materials. So that's an opportunity for businesses to use that material in more products. The UK Circular Plastics Network is funded from this 20 million pounds that Philip Hammond announced in the budget last year, and there is more money coming. The government are really hot on this. DEFRA are working really closely on what we should be doing. The 20 million pound has gone into funding Sky Ocean Ventures, uh, a, a, comp a competition with Sky Ocean Ventures, it's gone into R&D in universities, it's gone into businesses through a, um, a competition that I wrote, it's gone through RAP, which is the Waste Resource and Action Programme, 
and more and more and more. So if you want to know any detail about this, let me know. And what I would like to come out of today is me to follow the projects that we can, and if I can find funding for you, that would be absolutely cherry on the cake. So I run the UK Circular Plastic Network. Please join. Uh, Drew uh, has agreed to let me have your contact details so that I can ask you to become a member. If you don't want that to happen, will you please see me today or Drew and say, not interested. But if you join us, you can come to our events for free. You can see all the funding that's coming up. We've got lots of activities going on. We're going to have a landscape map, which I'm developing at the moment, which is just the whole lot of uh, efforts, initiatives, <coughs> reports in this area. It's a really useful tool for you. So what can we do? We can make new polymers. This is a bio-based uh, material being extruded uh, into a, 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 a string. We can look at new designs. So this is a refillable bottle. It's an LA-based company on the left. Or we can look at Gumdrop. I don't know if any of you have seen these. I met Anna, who's the uh, director of this company, about 10 years ago. The, the box is on a, a lamppost. You put your used gum in there instead of on the pavement, saving um, communities the, the money to, councils the money to clear it up. And you can recycle the whole thing. So the pink box is made from the gum that was collected inside. Really circular, fantastic idea. There are new recycling processes. My PhD was on depolymerization of polymers, and this is the process now. It's not, it was a long time ago I did it. <laughs> They're now working on it, and they've got equipment to do that. So we can make waxes and oils from waste material and film. There are new sorting mechanisms, clever ways of, of seeing whether you've had, say, bleach in your bottle or whether you've had uh, just a, a beverage. You can't recycle them in the same way because of the content. So this is a way of marking polymers. There are manufacturing pieces of equipment that have got filters on that will look at waste material, take out the dirt, make it cleaner so it can be used again. And there are new methods of delivering materials so you can get your cleaning products through your letterbox or also wine bottles. And I think Santiago from Gal San Wines will be here this evening. Uh, it's a fantastic idea. It's from a 100% recycled PET polymer, fits through your letterbox, and actually is such a space-saving thing and weight-saving that the carbon footprint of this plastic <laughs> material means that we are helping the environment by using plastic. Uh, there's lots of projects that have been funded through Innovate UK. This is all around flexible packaging. If you want to read it, feel free. Uh, but I just want to say about the space. People are ready, willing, um, and there are lots of activities going on. So politically, it's a good space uh, to do. Uh, there's business willingness. There are lots of solutions. Behavioural change is really key, and we haven't looked at it as I showed in that slide, but we've got to be careful of the unintended consequences. What we don't want to do is, is change what we're doing so that we end up making the carbon footprint higher than we, we're acting on at the moment, because actually the worst thing we could do then would, we would raise the temperature of the planet. So unintended consequences are really important to think about today. Uh, government funding, DEFRA strategy is in consultation at the moment about putting 30% recycled content, for example, back into uh, plastic packaging, deposit return schemes, legislation, producer responsibility is part of government uh, legislation. Of course, China have banned taking our waste and lots of the other Asian countries will do the same. I actually think, personally, this is a good thing. It means we've got to deal with our waste, we've got to use it, we've got to look at it as a resource. <coughs> Have a look at the RAP Pact. There are four um, Pact uh, pledges there, which are really key towards packaging. I think they're really interesting. Uh, Robin, I have your oh who in the slide there. So I just think this is really interesting. Terrible picture on the right, but on the left, we've got a sea-based material, which is a packaging for water. It's mm -hmm. consumable and edible. You don't, you're not left with any waste at all. So We have them for trial today. You've got them today? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, <laughs> Sky Ocean uh, Rescue, I think Vanessa, can you put your hand up, Vanessa? She's at the back. If you want to see Vanessa, this is current funding available for projects that are in this space that we're talking about today, so you might want to talk to Vanessa. There's some details here, but probably not important yeah. to you. Um, oh, I'll tell you when it closes. It closes on the 13th of March. Uh, also, Waitrose have just put out a, a million pound challenge for plastics uh, use in this space on the 24th of February. So again, if something comes out today, I can help you into that space if you're interested in applying. There are eight universities of a million pounds each. I'm going to go really quickly because you've got a couple more speakers, haven't you? Again, you can talk to me about all those. Imperial has one, which is uh, the bottom one here. It's on technology design and policy for greener plastic future. So it's been run out of this university. Lots of activity that you can get involved with, and I, I'm aware of what they're doing, so if there's anything relevant, I'll make sure I make the connections. And uh, a week and a half ago, Dow are leading uh, a £1 billion global alliance for, through the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, so that I don't know the details of this yet, but my goodness, I'm going to find out. Um, 
So up and coming, in progress at the moment, there is a £60 million fund that was announced in December by UKRI as part of the industrial strategy. It is called Sustainable <coughs> Smart Plastic Packaging, right in this space again. So it's looking at clever ways in which we can remodel and do something differently with our packaging. We hold a lot of events, but join and you'll find out. And that's our URL, and that's my contact details. So I just look forward to spending my Saturday with you and finding some really brilliant solutions. I think it's a great opportunity to get something done. So thanks Thank for you. inviting me. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Thanks a lot, Sally, for, uh, for the lovely introduction, and also for helping me on and leading the project. Uh, when you spoke before, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's great. Now I'm going to pass it over to the to Chris, who is going to talk about reuse, refill, has been really helping me out to uh, uh, get to where we are today with Leila, and he's going to talk, uh, he's going to set the team basically for the day, and then the focus, and from here on, he's going to take it from, from, from here. Chris. Cool. Yeah. It's good for light. Thank you. Thank you. I slightly feel like I'm hanging myself when I put that on. Um, good, Sally. Thanks for leaving me the tenner too. I really oh. appreciate that. I don't know if you want to take that back. I am bad with my plastic. <laughs> that one particularly, I think you want to. Um, great. So, um, yeah, I'm Chris Show, and I, I um, I'm the director of a small um, creative consultancy called Reboot Innovation, which none of you will have heard of, but I promise is relevant to, uh, for today. Um, and. Um, yeah, I want to move the discussion on a little bit to, um, so that we start focusing on this refill and reuse opportunity. Um, and yeah, just um, one slide on what I do. So, um, so yeah, what, I mean, I kind of, for, for 20 years or so, I specialized in connecting sustainability and innovation. Um, and that's, um, that's seen me sort of get involved with and help develop um, a number of kind of world's first and world's greenest products over the years from this quite sweet little Yo Valley Leftovers limited edition product which uses surplus ingredients on the left through recycled, mainstream recycled paint with Dulux through the world's most ethical um, smartphone, um, the Fairphone 2, through to something I'm working on at the moment with a fabulous startup called Winnow smart scales to reduce food waste in professional kitchens. And, and I guess what I want to draw out of that is, um, you know, is that quite a few of those started in a, in a creative workshop like this, you know, where we'd have sat together for a day or so with all the right people in the room, we'd have come up with lots of ideas, and the outputs of that would have led to things like this. Um, and I think, you know, that's our sort of challenge and opportunity for, the, for, for today, that this is this is possible and doable, and there are some great, uh, some great examples out there of you know, sort of seeds of ideas that have turned into real, you know, sort of concrete, impactful things. Um, now, one of the things I do is sort of leading and facilitating these hackathons and thinkathons, and you know, throughout the years they've been called jams and creative workshops and sprints is a, is a term. Um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Dhruv and I were at the ED event, the, the, the ED Corporate Sustainability Leaders event in London, and we were facilitating the ED Plastic Thinkathon. It's actually my first Thinkathon. Today it's our hackathon, it's not my first hackathon. Um, and that was, um, I mean, you'll see us there, we look a little bit tired and not very fashionable. Um, but um, that was two and a half hours, almost like an espresso version of what, we, what we're going to be doing today, in, in some ways to test the methods. But actually, that was with the corporate guys. So that was full of PwC, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, you know, lots of really big brands and big, big corporations. We had a really nice time, come up with some great ideas. But I guess the big takeaway from that was, um, you know, that was, that was the corporate guys. And in, today, we've got the budding entrepreneurs and innovators in the room. And we think you can do better. You know, we, th we think you can do more. But I guess what you take from that is, there's quite a lot going on. In fact, building on Sally's, Sally's comments and Sally's um, presentation, really quite a lot going on at the moment around, you know, around plastics innovation and, as I say, hackathons and thinkathons and sprints and fabulous 
funds and um, you know, research and development projects. And it does feel like there's something, you know, this is sort of something, something a little bit bigger going on. And I guess if you, if you sort of float above all of this and take a, take a slight helicopter view, actually you see that you know, sort of throughout, throughout history, almost every era, in, in some senses every generation has kind of had its own innovation paradigm. And I, you know, I tend to look at sustainability problems as innovation opportunities. And you know, if you look back through history, enlightenment, industrial revolution, modernism, you know, we've, all, we've, we've all had a sort of different wave, a different, if I could call it, paradigm for the way we innovate. And in the late 20th century, that was very much driven by oil, petrochemicals. The big, big companies in the world then were largest company, the largest global corporates with Exxon, Shell, BP, GE, you know, heavy industry, large oil-based <coughs> businesses. We went through the millennium, turn of the millennium, and obviously then we had the digital revolution. And the big businesses that came through then were things like <coughs> Facebook, Google, Amazon. You know, they're both the largest businesses in the world now. They're also some of the, some of the recognized best innovators. I think we're, we're moving into a sixth wave of innovation. And that's all around sustainability, circular economy, all the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. And that's kind of exciting for us, you know, that we're, we're part of, you know, we're, we're almost in the, in the foothills of, of, a, of, a, of a kind of new innovation revolution. And I want you to keep that in mind, in, uh, in mind as we go through t today. Um, so if I then dive, dive back down from that helicopter view, and actually just take a little bit of a look at, at you know, what, what's happening in the markets today. Um, you know, sort of how are, we, how are we innovating around you know, kind of plastic packaging waste? And I'm going to use the waste hierarchy, which Sally, I don't think you showed in your, in your presentation. So this gives us a really simple way to think about different strategies, if you like, to tackle plastic packaging waste. So, and I'm, I'm, I put this, I've interpreted this in a quite simple way, but it talks about almost four, top four steps you know, going from avoiding and redesigning out plastic packaging waste through reuse, through, um, through replacement and material substitution, to recycling. Um, and of course, at the top is the stuff that you should do more of, should, you know, it's what you should do the most, and towards the bottom, which is energy recovery from burning plastic or actually disposing of plastic. Um, you know, that represents, if you like, the ideal model. And I mean, it, as simplistically put, it does feel a little bit like we do this. Now, actually, if you look at the sum total of what brands do, and um, you know, it's probably changing a little bit in, in, in R&D, massive focus on recycling. You know, almost every brand making commitments around designing for recyclability, adding recycled content. Um, and then a lot, a, really a lot of work around material substitution too, so switching current oil-based plastics for you know, renewable or, re or recycled content. And that stuff's all great, right? And it's all absolutely necessary. But of course, it's us playing at levels three and four on this hierarchy. And I think what, we are, what I'd like us to do generally is to obviously move up to stages one and two. But crucially today, we're going to be focusing on reuse and refill. You know, what does that look like in practice? You know, if I could give you a visual model of that, it's probably this diagram. You know, so we're clearly going to be moving from linear to more circular and cyclical models. We're going to cross off landfill at the end. Quite clearly, we were always going to do that. But actually, also, we're going to cross off that, ma that material loop that's about recycling. That's kind of you know, not in scope for today. You can come up with a recycling idea, but you're not going to win at the end. <laughs> you know, you've, got, you've, got to, you've got to start thinking about these material and resource loops that are back around reuse in the home, around reuse in the store, and around reuse back to, back to manufacturers. Those are the sorts of models we'll be thinking about and using today. And the really great news is that there is an increasingly kind of clear commercial and creative case for both of those two things. And actually, reuse is really quite hard to do, having spent the best part of 10 years in creative consulting and doing lots of reuse and refill projects and never succeeding in getting a single one of them to market, hence the fact that they're not on, the <laughs> on those um, case studies before. This is actually quite difficult to do. But actually, as we move forward, it does look like the, the commercial case is starting to stack up here. This is fantastic work by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation looking at what they call a kind of vision of a new plastics economy. They suggested that reuse and refill could make up 20% of the solutions to our plastic problem. 20% doesn't seem like, like a lot, but actually it's a $9 to $10 billion commercial opportunity here. 
to any of you that are motivated by the sort of, you know, the cash at the end, and that's totally okay. Now this, this, makes, this makes business sense to get into re reuse and refill. And obviously they think that there are six really clear areas, and we're going to be discussing and covering some of these categories and areas today around personal care and ca possibly not carrier bags, but re beverage bottles, <coughs> pallet wraps, and there'll be a lot of work in the other reuse opportunities here today. Um, but yeah, that covers a really significant part of the plastic waste issue. But also there are, there'll be a few creatives in the room, myself um, not least, and there is an increasingly clear creative case for this. So it's about new ideas for you and getting excited by you know, the sort of creative limits here. Fabulous work by Loughborough, which defines 16 different refill and reuse models for personal care alone. I couldn't fit 16 on a slide, people, so there's only eight here. <laughs> And um, I'll just show you a couple of those. You know, so, so obviously, Gillette has been using a refill, reload model, recharge model, for actually over 100 years, um, you know, where, you have a, where you have a keeper, in this case, you know, a Gillette um, handle, and you buy little cartridges to plug into it. I'm not going to hold Gillette up as an example of c circular innovation, but actually that model is really, really successful. Refill stations, we see that increasingly now with zero-waste supermarkets. The good old-fashioned milkman. I can just about remember, I'm the age to remember the milkman delivering milk. Um, so, you know, the sort of door-to-door -door service, clearly an opportunity in some of the challenge areas you're going to be working in. Top-up cards is a form of refill, right? You know, when you buy music or you top up your mobile phone with a card, you're actually recharging or reloading something. Dispense, yeah, you know, it's controversial to put Nespresso up there, of course, but actually Nespresso is a form of refill, right? You get a pod, plug it into a dispenser. Um, and there's, a, there's a, again a really successful business model in there. Deposit systems, you know, where you where you where you get money back for for recycling. Or in, in, in the Netherlands and Germany, they have refill systems based around deposits. Um, novel forms of reuse, where you can reuse your packaging. In this case, as a um, you know, as, a, as some shelves for your for your wine bottle. Um, and then obviously swappable models like um, you know HP will take back your printer cartridges and wants them back because it can refill them. Obviously. That's only eight of the 16 potential areas that you can go into here, but we are absolutely convinced there is, there is some both ri really rich creative territories, but also some real commercial opportunities for you there. Ah, sorry, this slide didn't quite work in terms of the build, but never mind, so much for the dramatic end. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to end by, by, um, by talking about a famous sort of innovation theory. It's the, it's the image behind, um, which is, com comes from our... Harvard professor called Clayton Christensen. And he talks about the idea that um, he, he coined the term disruptive innovation. Right? And he basically you know, sort of proved that what you, don't, you don't get breakthrough innovation from incumbents. It's not normally the guys who are currently producing packaging you know, and currently you know, kind of the manufacturers, the brands, all that sort of stuff. You know, it isn't going to be the incumbents because they've got too much vested interest <laughs> too much invested in, you know, in their current way of doing things. It's, uh, real disruptive innovation comes from, you know, kind of people outside of that system coming in and gate crashing from the outside. And, you know, we, we've carefully selected you guys. We think you are the disruptors. Um, you know, we think that potentially there are some gate crashes in the room. Um, and I'd like to end with this idea that you know, six waves not going to come from current businesses, it's going to come from you. So let's disrupt today around um, plastic packaging waste together. Thank you. Oh, can I steal your microphone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when, when Drew was setting up, he, he made a joke or a Freudian slip of some kind where he said that the people coming in the evening were going to be even more interested. <laughs> uh, and I think Chris's call to arms is a great place to say that I think that you guys and what's going to happen now and the stuff that's going to, the discussions that are going to take place and the things you're going to develop and the ideas you're going to have is why we're here. And that's the exciting part. That's the most interesting bit. So uh, I am obviously very biased. So I'm a design engineer from here in the School of Design Engineering. And so the bit that I'm passionate about is, oh, here we go, is, is doing design. And so when I made this slide, I didn't realize that the person who designed this thing would be in the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so this is an example of some student work. So as I say, I've got quite an image-heavy presentation. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I am the last speaker of the day, and we're going to move into a period of action for the rest of the day with very little talking, uh, and we're just going to be talking to each other. So the discussion will move. Um, and so first things first, uh, I wanted to welcome you to the school and give you a few practical things before I jump into my talk. So uh, toilets. You might have seen when you were down below me in the cafe that there are some toilets next to where the food is being served. Uh, or, you know, throw a couple of doors that you can get there <laughs> from where the food is being served. Um, there are also some toilets behind you just where you came in. So if you go out to the school and go to the right, then you'll find some there. In there, you will also find packs which you can use. So these go in the bottles that you brought with you, but there should be some water also being distributed if you didn't bring anything refillable. Um, and then finally, if there's a fire, you can exit the room from either side, and there's a staircase at either end. So when you entered the building downstairs, you came in near the staircase, which is at this side of the building, see some doors hidden behind the screen. Uh, there's also some stairs where you came up to get here on the other side of the building. <coughs> exit whichever way is quicker, and then head to a lawn which has a big tower on, which is just over there. So that's our fire assembly point. So if you get out of the building, Go down the street a bit, follow the trees, you'll see this place, maybe underneath the massive tower. If, if the worst happens, hopefully we'll be okay. Um, so I promise this slide has the most text on it, uh, just to introduce myself a bit. So uh, my name's Layla, I'm a lecturer here in the School of Design Engineering. Um, I'm actually a design engineer by practice, so I say actually, because the design engineering department here at Imperial is a really exciting space where lots of people from dis different disciplines come together. And so actually, there's very few <coughs> design engineers. Um, but I trained as a design engineer. I used to work in product development. I made stuff. So I made bits for motorbikes, and I made white chickens, and I made all sorts of things. Uh, and the reason I came back to academia, uh, I went to do my PhD in sustainable design, because I really wanted to see what we could do to make design better, how could designers be supported to make better uh, and that's kind of snowballed to where I am now, uh, which is a bit more general than just looking at sustainability because now I'm more curious about the future. And so I've categorized that into three things here because what I found is working with designers, often they don't have so much power as designers and engineers. So I'm trying to see if we can get to them. They're a bit locked in by the nature of the company with that kind of thing. So part of my role is looking at who designers will be in the future. What will their roles involve? How will engineers' uh, role in the business change as Um, and then once they get there, how can they actually then design them sustainably? What uh, new tools will they need? How, what new materials might they need? How will that work actually look like? Uh, and then finally, uh, we look at how to work with people. So how to use tools from scenario planning, how to use slightly more out there tools that help you imagine a different future, try and break some of those cycles and get people to think differently. So rather than saying I do sustainability, now I say I work with the so here in the School of Design Engineering, we have uh, an intersection where not just teaching happens. Uh, when we think of universities, we tend to think just of the kind of amazing people that we turn out with our teaching. But we have uh, three activities in here, where one is teaching, one is the research that we do here in the school, and one is practice. So all of us, myself included, uh, have these three things in. So I do practice by working consulting with businesses, uh, but I do my research with companies and with other people to develop new ideas, and I then teach my students those ideas to try and send out an army of people prepared to work better in the future. So this is kind of at the heart of what we do, is really trying to make impact by combining these three activities. Um, and so you've already seen one of these pictures today. Uh, from this school, we run three degree programs, and out of these degree programs and out of our research activities, we've already had a number of innovations in this space. So you saw the easy one, which is one of the students from our postgrad. In the middle uh, is another student who came up through our postgrad and is now actually doing her PhD with me. And she's launched a product which is looking at tapping feather weights. So she's using feather weights as an insulation material. And then on the far right is a student project, which I thought would be a good one to highlight today, where a <coughs> student was looking at recycling orange peel to make edible ice cream scoops through the Easter ice cream recipe, uh, which was quite an interesting one. So we have a lot of this kind of work coming up. So 
filtering through in combination with the research that's happening and in combination with the people here in college. And it's a really fertile place for new ideas to combine with some of the fundamental technology that's taking place. So Imperial <coughs> and the School of Design and Engineering, which is only three years old, is becoming a really unique place for that kind of next step as well. Oh. Um, and so then what we do is actually take those ideas forward. So in the middle with the red hair is Elena who made the staggered product, Lumen, in the middle. And so she now actually teaches a class in our second year, uh, helping them develop materials, actually along with Anish, who is at the back. Uh, so we have another PhD student who is our resident uh, sustainable materials superhero. And she's actually working with Gillette in the description of some of their material drinks, amongst others. And she has a, a nice table of material samples. It's not necessarily stuff that was developed here at Imperial, but actually some of the examples she's seen of the flat wine bottle and other stuff is on the table outside, which you can go and play with for some inspiration. So, you stand behind the lectern, so you can be oh, online for the Sorry. <laughs> I hate being a prisoner behind these things. Um, so, so, essentially, everything that we're doing kind of comes together in this way and gets fed back. So, it's a <coughs> feedback loop. And so, one of the tenets of this way of working, of trying to bring all these people together and cross pollinate, is that we really try and have diverse teams. We try and bring in diverse students with different interests, with different skills. <coughs> we bring in experts to work with them. We bring in people from industry. And the idea is that this creates the right environment for this sort of innovation. So you'll see that that's what we've tried to recreate today with you guys coming from all over the place uh, with the intention that that's how impact happens, by helping give the students context, by helping the students give fresh ideas and fresh perspectives and by feeding that with the fundamental research and the rigor that's coming through in what we do. Uh, here in the college as well, we're really lucky that there's an incredible innovation community which is springing up around now helping students realize those ideas. So today we have a lot of Imperial students in the room who will be working with you, um, and as well as Sally, who's here to help maybe take some ideas forward, as well as the Sustainable Ventures team that are here to help take some ideas forward. <coughs> We have a community here in Imperial that's ready to support potentially the development of those ideas or collaboration with some businesses who might be here today and want to see what's happening. There's loads of scope for getting involved beyond what goes on in this room here in college. So that's my bit done, my kind of Imperial welcome sales pitch. And I'll move on to telling you a bit about what we're actually going to do today. So we have placed you in these interdisciplinary teams, which are a bit of a mix. So Dhruv came to me and said, I want to run a hackathon, and I want to put all these amazing people that I've been meeting over the last year, he's, he's been doing all of his activism. And I said, great, but if you put all of these amazing people who are doing amazing things and doing their own things, what's going to happen to the ideas? They're just going to get left on the table and everybody's going to return to do their stuff. So that's why we brought all of these young people into the room. We brought people who are already starting businesses who are entrepreneurs we've got students who are going to graduate soon we've got people in the room who can coalesce around these ideas and take them forward and we're hoping that new partnerships and new things form today um, we also have a huge supporting cast of people who will be floating around the room so you've been placed in teams but we also have some experts who are here to help and who are going to float around and chat to you throughout the day uh, and we have a huge hackathon helper team um, who, how many people are in the room? Should we stand up so that people know whose faces you are? Are they all outside? Are we, are oh, Jake. Teams, or yeah. <laughs> so. It's me, it's a huge team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave the I'm really fast at running between the rooms. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Sally's one of our experts today. He'll be floating around with that journey. Yeah, that's amazing. There we go. We have a whole host of other people, designers, Robinson Trustee, people who are working in soft tech, so who are going to be floating around the room trying to even ask you these questions. So it's well worth being in your team, so there's going to be a flop, <laughs> who are going to be wandering around to kind of uh, post these kind of people on track to ask you these really fun questions. So thank you guys. <laughs> Um, so today, we do this all in, uh, it's obviously a volunteer-led day. Uh, we do have some sponsors who are helping with some of the costs of putting on something like this, but the spirit of today is one of openness. 
And so uh, if you're super curious, you can go and read more about open design, but it's a fairly self-explanatory concept, a bit like open source software and that kind of thing, that we, we want the ideas that are developed today to be uh, open, to be shared with each other, to be discussed openly. Uh, some of it might be live streamed to the internet. Uh, we, we might publish the ideas at the end. We want these to be things that people can build on each other's ideas that might spark other people to have better ideas. Uh, this, it, we come together in a spirit of openness today. So uh, I want to emphasize that as we set out on this journey. Um, and I know that it's called a hackathon. And so uh, to me, a hackathon is something that is like a long thing which lasts a really long time. Sometimes they go 24 hours. And so uh, Chris touched on some of the terminology in his speech. But what I really wanted to say is that Today is going to feel a lot like a sprint. It's going to be really intense. Uh, and the marathon bit comes afterwards when you actually have to develop that idea. So this is just like trying to find interesting people, find some interesting concepts. This is really just the beginning of potentially a longer journey. And so we are going to race through uh, to the bit that's black, and then we won't get as far as the bit that's grey today, which is the important bit, which is where a lot of solid ideas happen. And so. We have split the day into these two parts that are highlighted in green, uh, where we're going to do a couple of things which are helping you understand the problem a bit better uh, in the first half of the day before we get on to the second half, which is starting to think about the solutions. So even though today is about solutions and about ideas, it's going to feel like we're doing a lot of other stuff for a long time, but that's to try and get you inspired, get you on the same page and try and unpack some of the existing challenges. So this is what the day looks like. You do have a rough agenda on, on the list that you were handed as you came in. Um, but we have uh, one task now before lunch, which is uh, system mapping, starting to unpack what your systems are. Uh, then we have a break. And then after lunch, Chris is going to take us through some of his reuse refill topologies and try and inspire you with some of the work that's already been done and get you to think about how those models could be applied. Uh, then we're going to do idea generation, and you'll be well fed with caffeine and sugar throughout the day to keep things moving. So there'll be coffee and cake during that phase. And then in the afternoon, we head into idea development. And actually, this morning part, we're going to put you in five, the five challenge areas that were on the invitation. So you'll see around the room, we have work zones, which have labels and worksheets. In each zone, you'll be working on the challenge area. So on the list, you should see your name under one of those challenges already. Uh, but then in the afternoon when it gets to idea development, we're actually going to let you split into smaller teams. So you're going to be working in teams of about nine uh, for the morning, but by the afternoon we expect that you might have met another four or five people that you like the same idea, and then you'll split into a smaller team, develop your idea, and then pitch it in the evening. So you will see in each of these five zones that we have a sheet like this uh, blue tacked up to the side, which uh, we've called an insight tracker. So to help you keep track of some of the activities that we're doing and to help you think about some things that we haven't got too much time to go into explicitly but we think are important, uh, we've put an insight tracker up, which has these four sections of the system mapping ex exercise, the topologies exercise, thinking about your customer, and then maybe some wildcard thoughts you have. So the idea is that you won't have to hold all the information from all the activities in your head, but at the end of each activity, you'll use this to throw up three key points from your team, and then this will become the thing that you can use to then help you with ideas generation at the end of these first two sessions. Oh, <laughs> skip past that. Um, so on each table, you'll see one of these for the system mapping exercise. And uh, all we want you to do is look at the various sections. And so it's organized by the stages of a product life cycle. So first you become aware of something. How does, how does somebody know that your product exists? Then you decide to buy it. You maybe customize it. You specify what you want. Uh, you actually make the purchase, as in this thing is made for you, or maybe it was made before. Then it might get delivered. It might just carry it away with you. Then you use it and then reuse. So thinking about all those stages, we've got space for you to throw down post-it notes and pens. There's lots of stuff on every table to scribble things, draw stuff, go crazy. This morning's task is to fill out one of these for a product. So you'll be sent to your tables and your teams. You'll think of a product that you want to do this for in the category that you've been given, and then you'll populate this sheet. 
Oh. <laughs> okay, so that's as far as we're going to go for now. Um, did everybody get a kind of list with names on when they came in? Mm -hmm. Some people not yet. I've got one. Okay. So, in that case, you might need to run directly to one of the I'll find a file. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can put up the list.
Okay, for those of you who've been watching, we've seen the opening hour of the Plastic Hackathon, setting up a day of solutions. And the person who's created this whole concept is Drov Brewer, who's with us today. So I'm just Hi. going to ask him a few questions about this whole concept. Yeah. So, so tell us, Drov, how did this whole thing come about? Because, you know, uh, I have been doing a lot of raising awareness and have reached a lot of people. But then it was clearly going nowhere. Uh, there's no solutions. I was unable to make any dent in the, in the real thing, no tangible value at all. And then time is running out, as I tell, extra time. We don't have time left in this game of uh, football in Mother Nature. And we can't. It's just 10 more minutes left. And I thought I have to do something about this stuff. And the classical innovation process in corporations are failing. Because the same bunch of people talking the same thing, why things cannot be done. So I had to really disrupt. I, I love disruption. Disrupt the whole corporate innovation with young people, with the industry experts from the whole value chain. The unique thing here is that the young people can challenge them and they can challenge the young people. And we have people from waste management, from plastic manufacturers, from retailers. No one speaks to each other. Today is the day we are going to have these big strides on the, closing the whole loop of the circular economy. So we have every stakeholder work on it, talk about it, work together, make these introductions, the network begins to, begins to grow. And I hope they will be able to solve it. I'm definite. I'm definite. Yeah, We need to bring them together and someone had to do it. I had to do it. I had to put my neck on the line to make it happen. Otherwise, this was not happening. It's, it's my neck on the line because the last two years, and, and, and I paid for this whole hackathon. We had the sponsors in the last minute. I had to put the neck on the line because no one believed me. And who am I, really? Just raising awareness. Who the hell are you? But now I'm trying to get this solution revolution going, change the mindset of people from awareness to solutions. Let's solve it, save the planet, and make money by doing that. I'm not doing charity here. Let's solve the planet and, and make money. So you, you were driven to have this passion yeah. following your experiences of sailing on parts of the clip around the world Absolutely. yacht race and yes. you played some video earlier yes. showing a, a turtle being rescued were you shocked at the scale and the reach of plastic pollution? Absolutely. That video is uh, from a different boat. We had to rescue on my boat. But then I have seen flip-flops and other stuff myself, and I was shocked when I saw this in the middle of the ocean. It's a round-the-world race. We go to remote corners of the planet, you know, in, in tough conditions. And when you see plastics uh, there, then it really uh, reminds you that how deep we have been and how bad the crisis is. And I hate giving the bad news. I was giving a lot of talks and giving the bad news. I hate giving the bad news that plastic is inside our body, in the water we drink and everywhere else. Someone had to do this, and definitely that was a key moment that, you know what, someone needs to put their neck on the line and make it happen, than just talking about it. So how does it make you feel seeing this hackathon coming together here today? I'm incredibly happy and incredibly proud, and I'd love to thank everyone for believing in me, that I can pull up this kind of event, and I can bring them here to... To, to believe in me and to f get them to the solutions. I mean, I can't believe it how they believe me so much that they're all here. The young people, the industry experts, you know, from the whole supply chain. Uh, Michael Gove, uh, MP, has uh, sent a quote, you know. Uh, we've got these amazing sponsors who are really helping. I really believe in the, uh, in the mission we have. And DEFRA has been tweeting. I just can't believe that uh, the, the help I have. So I thank everyone. And now the thing is, so what happens tomorrow? That's important. Today we are done. Amazing ideas. Go back home, go back to my job. My job actually starts on Monday to actually trying to help all these business and solutions that starts that comes up today to bring them to market. That's when my job actually begins. This is just the beginning. This is not the this is just the beginning. My job is to change the mindset of solutions but also help them bring it to market, make it as easy as possible. And I think with all these incredible partners in the room here, we'll be we'll be we'll make some big changes. So they've now broken into their first teams. Just to explain in brief what they're doing right now. Uh, they're just uh, breaking down the whole supply. Uh, the, the, they're picking up one challenges and they're breaking it down into different pieces and pieces, analyzing the whole value chain, uh, at what point they can interject and make some changes to reduce the amount of plastic. Uh, the focus of this is reuse and refuel. So they're going through the whole process of uh, uncluttering or, or understanding the whole, whole chain of things, chain, chain of events so in the whole supply chain. So they can understand where uh, the maximum effective they would be throughout the whole course of the day. And they have experts from every industry and every team and that's incredible because uh, uh, they have experience right there for example just eat uh, robin is here he knows everything about the takeaway and the restaurant business and commercial side of things he can tell straight away this does not work because he knows the pricing why it does not work and we don't have to wait another 12 months for this pricing report to come from a big brand we have everything right here all the knowledge right here to really accelerate or or turbocharge these solutions because we let's not do the let's not spend one to six months uh, trying to do a market research the market research has been done the industry experts are here let's make something out of it i'm really excited uh, to see what's going to happen by the end of the day, definitely, yeah. So those ideas are going to develop throughout the day, and yeah. then what have you got planned for the end of the day? The end of the day, we have uh, obviously a pitching process where they're going to pitch the, the ideas. Uh, 
problems, what the problem they're solving, the solution that they have, how innovative the solution is, the competition in the market, and then we talk about that, um, uh, really dive deep in the solutions, you know, why it's unique, then we talk about the opportunity, the market size of the of the opportunity, and then we're going to talk about, um, so, um, when, uh, what's the revenue model, what's the business model, how are you going to get customers, how are you going to expand in the market, what's the growth strategy, because we can help them scale, I can, we can help people scale. That's the biggest challenge. We have everyone here with scale. Max and Spencer's with their scale. Just it with their scale. Imagine all these consumers that they reach. We can, we can just, we have all the scale to scale all the businesses. That's, that's really powerful. So we're going to talk about all that and in the end, the final uh, deal. What's your deal basically? Uh, how much funding you're looking for? Or what do you need? You know, do you need help with R&D? Do you need help with scale? All, all kinds of stuff. And then we have a mix of impact investment funds, public funds, all, and we're going to explore if it's investable. So at the end of the day, we have two things. One is Sustainable Ventures has been really kind enough to, um, to give them free advice to make these ideas uh, uh, financeable or investable, and an opportunity to pitch in front of them for 100 to 150,000 uh, pounds, definitely. And we have Crowdcube, actually, who's offering them half the workshop uh, uh, around uh, to show them how crowdfunding can be a tool to take these businesses forward. I'm really excited uh, by, by the last thing. You know, how can you take this from here? You know, what can you do? I hope people will quit, quit their jobs. Well, I'm not sure, but I hope they will, like me. <laughs> Unemployed for the last two years. I think it was calculated that in the UK alone, something like 60 billion pieces of plastic are produced every year yeah. to support the retail and consumer yeah. economy. Yeah. So what is the potential impact if some of these ideas here today actually uh, transform what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have these biggest challenges here, uh, say takeaway, you know? Uh, the amount of takeaway packaging that we have is incredibly high. Not just the packaging, but also the, the, the sachets and things like that. And they are already trying out new materials and new business models. We'll have a huge impact. And we have the personal care products. And we have a lot of people from personal care brands here today, and also from retailers who are focused on personal care. And they, they will be learning a lot, and we'll be able to big, make a big dent in that. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not against plastic, but if you have innovative business models to reduce the amount of plastic, because, in, because people do not want the packaging. They're not buying the packaging, they're buying the product. I want my shampoo. Deliver it to me in any way you can. I don't want the packaging. I really don't want the packaging. And if we can do something like that, it will inspire people to really be inspired, to get inspiration. And people need the service, not the packaging. So why are we focusing a lot on the packaging? So now we are going to work around business models to reduce the packaging. And, and that, that you say all the numbers, I think we'll have a big dent. One of my KPIs, I don't have them yet, but the KPIs from the companies here, if they go to the market, will be uh, for the business model, what's the, what's the key performance indicator will be around the amount of plastic they are reducing by, by every usage and, and the carbon footprint and everything. Not just the plastic is linked to many other things and you know more than the slavery all kinds of stuff and I guess the whole point is the reduction not necessarily the elimination of plastic but to move from single use to multi use through reuse refill yeah. the focus today yes reuse and refill to multi use I mean plastic is an incredible material right lasts for 700 years why are you chucking it away if you make it a bit stronger and, and we can reuse it for like thousand two thousand three thousand times and so it makes huge dent. The focus today is reuse and refill. We'll have other hackathons with different themes and reduce and, and recycle and things like that. But the focus today is, is reuse and refill, yeah. And to reduce some of the packaging by, re, by promoting reuse and refill business models. And when you talk about profitable solutions, I guess that's because they have to be sustainable yeah. financially. Absolutely. Unless it's, it's profitable, it will not be, we'll not be able to scale. Then all these business, businesses will be a small uh, family-owned business in a corner of a, of a little town. Do, we have to really scale these businesses. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the economy is structured in that way today that only profits uh, is when we'll be able to scale this using a distribution of big brands and things like that. Uh, the, the money is how it's being designed. So we have to, unless we sort out the economy, uh, uh, the design of the economy, that's the only way forward is to via profits. Uh, I hate to tell you that, but that's the only motivation that the corporations have. And you know what? There's money to be made. Unfortunately, that's the hard truth. There's a lot of money to be made. Your new consumers are not going to buy your stuff. They're, they're not going to buy. It's a big opportunity coming up. So everyone wins. The planet wins. The, the profit wins. Everyone wins. It's a win-win. It's right. It has to be a win-win. Well, thanks very much, no, Drew. Uh, yeah. Are you in one of these groups? Or are you? Not yet. Yeah, hopefully, but we'll see. Yeah, not yet, but yeah. Okay. I will try to get in, learn from them. That's why I'm here. Right. Well, yeah. thanks. Thanks very much, Nate. Thanks, Drew. Thank thanks, and uh, we're coming back with a second live stream uh, towards the end of the day, probably around about 6.30 p.m., when we can see what these guys have come up with. So for now, goodbye. Thank you.